we will now reconvene the oh, Lompoc regular meeting, Lompoc City Council regular meeting for Tuesday, September 1st, 2020 is now reconvened. For open session, roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Mosby. Present. Councilmember Starbuck. Present. Councilmember Vega. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Gilda Cordova. Present. Mayor Janelle Osborne. Here. Mr. Malave reporting for closed session. Yes, thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session and discussed the one item on the agenda with staff and gave direction to staff, but no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Presentations made elsewhere, proclamations honoring Davika Stalling as 2020 Lompoc Valley Woman of the Year and Victor Jordan as the 2020 Lompoc Valley Man of the Year were presented to the recipients at the Chamber's remote ceremonies. Certificates of recognition were also presented to Scott Reardon in honor of being recognized as Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce Visitors Bureau Volunteer of the Year and to Superior Home Health, Hospice and Senior Services in recognition of receiving the Lompoc Valley of Commerce and Visitors Bureau Small Business Excellent Award. Congratulations to all winners. City Manager report, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, our first one is that I mentioned it last time, the census is coming to an end. As a city, we've now, the good part is as a, as a county, we've now surpassed the 2010 census by having almost 70% of the citizens respond. I would love to see the last 30%, however, come out and help, help us by taking a simple five minute survey. All of this in turn would benefit the city and the county as it opens up more federal and state grant opportunities for us. Um, the other one is the city council should have received the annual report from Explore Lompoc in their boxes. So you have that for your reading enjoyment. Another good one is the Lompoc Library is getting closer to a partial reopening. The state is finalizing reopening guidelines for the libraries, and the library is also working on their full recarpeting project. People probably don't realize a majority of the carpet that is in there is from the 1980s, and even some of the offices have the original carpet, which is now over 50 years old in them. So they'll be working on that as they're waiting for the guidelines once all that's done, uh, we'll be putting out a press release and, and guidelines on how and what will happen to go in and use the library. Last is tennis and pickleball, pick, I can say that, tennis and pickleball courts are now open. Um, we wanna be sure that everyone's following all the public health order guidelines. These are all posted at the different sites, so please read those and abide by them, but they are now open for use. And the last one, it's hard to believe it's already been a month since we talked about this, but I need to bring up as we last talked that during the pandemic, um, at the first meeting of each month, I need to ask the council, do we still want to continue canceling the council, different commission meetings? Um, currently nothing has changed on the public health order and last one just came out and, and they did allow barber shops and hair salons to open, but they really haven't changed anything else since that point in time. Um, and, so I'm throwing that out there as requested to see if you want to continue with that. Councilmember Mosby. You know, starting in November, you're going to start going through the capital improvement plan. I'm just wondering if maybe you should have the commissions doing some review over that capital improvement plan. And, you know, they, they're able to figure it out, I guess. They, it is a little rough with the public comment. But uh, I know there's, there's quite a few meetings that go on in this this area here. So I, th I think as our advisory groups, they should start chewing through this massive $450 million capital improvement plan, but they are our advisory group and maybe they should start reviewing that. Didn't mean to. Council Member Vega. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think the commission should be able to meet as long as they have an agenda and a goal. So we have two council members who um, 
feel that these meetings, other than planning commission, is reasonable to meet if they have an agenda? Council Member Starbuck. Well, I, I would concur with that. I'm just curious about, you know, they're going to meet. When are we going to allow the public to come back? We're not going to have a gathering. We're going to have a government meeting. There's seats for a few people. I mean, we could limit it to the same attendance that you get at a barber shop here, 25% of capacity or whatever else. Yeah, I mean, sorry, Mayor, if I may. Um, currently, we're just following the county guidelines from the public health officer, which is they specifically said all cities would have to close their council chambers. So if we're holding commission meetings in here, they would also have to follow those guidelines. The other piece just to point out is um, with the phone calls and whatnot, that would entail additional staff time, which at that point in time would probably, if they're holding them at the 6.30 time, would be overtime that we would have to then make sure there's enough people in, in, in here to do that. There are some additional costs. Councilmember Mosby. I mean, it is a, what, $450 million plan, so I think it's uh, important enough that it should be reviewed. I think, sure, there's going to be some additional costs, but maybe we had some savings the last few months we didn't have any, so... I just want to. I just want to make sure it's. It was pointed out. Councilmember Cordova. I was going to suggest so as to not maybe trigger any uh, additional expenses, even if we've saved some money. I still want to see the savings and the final numbers at the end. Um, what if we ask the commissions to put together a subcommittee that can start working on this instead, and then as soon as um, we are able to reopen City Hall and have the meeting, or there could be a recommendation by that subcommittee made to the um, commission or to the council, just something to think about. That is one way to address it, the groups um, being able to meet and discuss something without having to have a public comment and staff support if if that is something the rest of council would consider. Council Member Mosby. Well, I guess you'd have to have a meeting so you could organize the subcommittee meeting. So why not have a full meeting? You know, you're talking two meetings right now that before it comes, things start coming back to the council. So, and it's gonna take a little while to organize. I wouldn't think you would be doing it this next month. It'd be the following month uh, anyways. I imagine it'd be probably pretty rough to put these commission meetings together this month if they are gonna look over the, I'm, I'm, So it's they're there for oversight and I think we need to get them back involved. So it sounds like we're putting it on hold for one more month with the recommendation that beginning in October, potentially having commission meetings to potentially review the capital improvement program proposal. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, please. Could we send, uh, could my office send an email to each and every member of a body with the capital improvement plan attached and ask for any um, suggestions or questions be provided to Mr. Troop? Um, let's get clarification from Mr. Malave regarding Brown Act and Brown Act being put aside for some of the meetings that exist and how this affects those. You can send the capital improvement program to every single commissioner and ask and tell them that if they have questions, they can ask staff, either Mr. Troop or their board staff. Okay. Uh, I think that is one way to start addressing it without having formalized meetings. And if it rises to enough questions from a particular commission, then we might consider a special meeting for them, which wouldn't require us to have the, all of the committees and commissions come back. Is that a sol workable solution? Councilmember Vega. Uh, I think for the month of September, yes. Uh, we, we said we would come back and review it on a monthly. Uh, so with the month of September, we're already into it. So I think that's gonna be an easy one here. So if they could just send out all the information to all the commissioners and we'll address it come October uh, about actually having them meet. So I think that kind of solves both problems. Okay. Councilmember Cordova. Yeah, I was just going to say I would support that, getting the information out to the committee or commissioners. Is that enough clarity? Okay. Yes, and then you would want it to come back on October 6th. Is that correct for another review of yeah. the cancellations? Thank yeah. you. Things may have changed by then. Hopefully we'll see more success with the current pattern of um, criteria that we have to meet to, to regain opening. Okay, so just so that we're clear, by the end of this week, I should have it to every single member. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
Appreciate it. All right. Any other council member Mosby? How are we doing with the parks with opening up for um, conditioning for sports? Um, I'm not quite sure. You mean how, how do we do that or how are, are they? Are they open? Are the parks open now? Yes. Or, yeah, so? the, the parks are open for the conditioning. Um, the adult sports, those types of organized are still not allowed per the public health order. Um, if they're youth sports, they can do different types of conditioning, but they're still required. Like if they're doing soccer drills, they still have to have them spaced apart, but those have been open, yes. But they are open, or do we have people doing that, utilizing the parks? Yeah, there, there's definitely some okay. people out Good. there. That's why this, um, um, what was the other one I just talked about, was the uh, pickleball, pickleball and tennis courts. Those can go out and be open now, and then we have um, the signs all posted the way they follow supposed to follow all of the different guidelines that the public health order states on there. And we have limited hours on the tennis and pickleball, right? I have to look at that. I, I think they're being observed as well. Isn't there a staff member watching them? To uh, no, they're oh, no. not being observed. Their signage and everything's there for them. But I okay. believe I saw today it was to 9, 9 p.m. A member of the public told me it was a limited hours and there was a, had to be a staff member present. But the no. The initial thought was we would have to have a staff member there, but with all the continual changes of the public health orders that we can now have it signed, that it just has a big placard up there that says, follow these rules. So. Very good, thank you. And for the clarity for the public, when they say um, youth sports, it's conditioning only, it's no games, so no little league games, no t-ball games, none of the games can actually be formal playing, It's but you can go out as a team and practice hitting balls and doing practice for potential games if they potentially are uh, eventually allowed for organized sports. That is correct. Thank you. All right, we will move on to the consent calendar. Um, public comment on the consent calendar is now open. The number to call is 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, radio, and or computer when your call is put through, 805-875-8201. Did we have any written communication on the consent calendar? No, ma'am. Thank you. Consent calendar is considered to be a routine and enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to council vote. Any items withdrawn from the consent calendar for separate discussion? will be addressed immediately before the second oral communication near the end of the meeting. Hello, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi, my name is John Del Malcolm. I wanted to speak on a subject that was talked about on the August 18th, 2020 um, agenda. Council Member Mosby questioned the city attorney about the June 3rd uh, meeting and the minutes. He felt it would be appropriate to have some recognition about how the meeting was postponed or delayed um, because the meeting, the minutes did not reflect that information. Um, the city manager uh, called and asked the council members to vote this vote should be public, letting the public know how the vote was administered, why the meeting was um, canceled, and who voted either in favor of or against moving the meeting. Um, the city attorney responded that the vote is uh, public information, and he stated that it should be added to the minutes. Um, I submitted a public information request on July 1st requesting this information, and I asked that um, there's, because there should have been a meeting and notes that should have been taken with regard to the cancellation of the city council meeting, there should have been a vote rendered to cancel said meeting. And I requested the results of that vote, the reason for the cancellation, any emails, texts, written notes, or verbal instructions that were given. Um, I also requested the reason and approval for the meeting to be held on June 3rd at 1.45. The city provided me with emails confirming that the city manager reached out to the council members with concern over the planned protest. Unfortunately, the city declined to provide any information beyond that, citing government code section 6254K, which is attorney client privilege. 
And I find this particularly interesting that Councilmember Mosby is asking for the same information and it is now deemed public information. And as of today, that information is still not made available to the public. Um, also with Councilmember Mosby requesting this during the consent calendar, like I said again on August 18th, um, the, the city failed to give the public time for oral communication regarding this matter. And I think that's wrong. Thank you. Eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one for public comment. Remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi, this is Chris Braxton, uh, former Parks Commissioner and active participant in youth sports in Lompoc. Uh, the question that I have is I think there's some misleading information being given and provided with regards to youth activities and sports. Uh, documentation that was provided still shows that uh, sports gatherings of teams, including adult, amateur, nonprofit, nonprofessional team sports, are not able to gather. Uh, parks and playgrounds are remaining closed. so. I think we're being given misguided information, and that is still from the order that was given by the county in March, uh, with no provisions being made. So I know that uh, many people are interested. Many people want to get back out and participate. Uh, you know, the parks are our health and wellness as we move forward with this pandemic. Um, but I think we need to really clarify because the documentation that I was just provided this week by Parks and Rec staff to validate that um, is just pretty much contradicted what's on what I'm reading in black and white right now is what was just presented uh, in the city council chamber. Thank you. Eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one. The comments for consent calendar are what we are accepting at the moment. All other comments should be held to the next oral communication. Seeing no one else call, we will close public comment on consent calendar and bring it back to council. We have one item on the agenda. It is approval of the minutes for the regular meeting. I will move to accept them. Second. Council member Cordova. As seconded, any other questions, concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Now we will have staff presentations. The first is Planning Manager Brian Halverson will provide a report on the City Council Ad Hoc Committee suggestions to update the 2030 General Plan. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm going to give a, a very brief presentation tonight regarding the 2030 general plan and specifically uh, where we're at with the ad hoc committee. As you all remember, uh, there was a desire for the Council uh, to look at the general plan again with some fresh eyes and um, talk about potential amendments. And direction was given that an ad hoc committee be formed to talk about those amendments. So right now, to date, we have draft comments from two of the council members that serve on this ad hoc committee. That's council member Vega and council member Starbuck. Um, we've looked at those comments and they primarily relate to several elements of our general plan. As you see here above, um, the land use element, circulation, housing, economic development, Conservation open space elements are primarily where those comments are, have been made. Um, in terms of the comments, I'm just giving a brief um, overview of what staff has reviewed. Um, there's a lot of statements in the general plan that have shall statements where the ad hoc committee has 
expressed that some of those shall statements should be should. Um, there's also um, a lot of proposed uh, deletions. Um, some of those are actually mitigation measures from the final environmental impact report that was required to be completed in order to adopt that 2030 general plan. And then lastly, there's um, a lot of questions um, that are stated, either um, written down or highlighted, or you know, these are just rough comments at, at this moment. So what would need to occur is uh, actual sit-down meetings uh, to further discuss what those questions are um, and then engage other city departments and actually have um, some formal meetings. Uh, also, staff looking at these uh, preliminary comments, um, they do need, um, they are considered significant. So I'll just kind of put that out there right now that these are not just minor little tweaks um, in the general plan. These are quite significant uh, that need uh, a general plan analysis and further review. Um, also, I think I mentioned last year and maybe actually the year before when from time to time when we talk about the general plan that um, there are new laws that require environmental justice policies to be incorporated into the general plan if we amend two or more elements. Obviously, as you saw on the screen, uh, the comments I've received from ad hoc are, are definitely two or more. Um, so if an amendment moved forward, we would need to address environmental justice as well. Uh, as far as steps and just kind of guiding, uh, putting a little direction in the process is everybody's aware that the general plan is actually a community document. It represents the city of Lompoc. It uh, has significant input from community members, people that, ha that are stakeholders, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, input from the community is, is very, very important. Um, and also um, environmental review would need to be completed. And then um, eventually when we do have some, some actual uh, concrete um, comments that would be incorporated into you know a formal written document that would be reviewed by local state and federal agencies um, the ad hoc committee um, those comments would be eventually discussed in a public forum as well and uh, additional comments from the public would be received on those on those comments um, next steps um, I'm going to suggest and obviously um, the purpose of this short uh, presentation is to engage the council on next steps, but additional meetings with the ad hoc committee uh, should, be, um, should be completed. Right now, the ad hoc committee has mostly been um, some discussions either over the phone or with our director of community development, um, you know, handwritten notes and things like that, going through kind of digging into some of the things that the ad hoc committee likes or doesn't like. Um, so it, it would be good to, one, establish a timeline, a budget, uh, the, because these are significant amendments, we do need to get a budget moving forward, including the environmental review, uh, based on what I've reviewed, but it's just kind of a, a quick look at it as far as not digging in too deep, is this is not something that would just be an addendum, but it would be uh, a larger environmental document. And again, in order to refine the amendments, uh, you want to start to engage the public. Um, that's my short presentation based on what the ad hoc committee has given us so far on the 2030 general plan. And that concludes the staff presentation and we're available to answer any questions at this time. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, I'm not buying a bunch of this, Brian. Shell shoulds are not environmental. Most of these changes are deletions of things that don't pertain to the city and are not mitigation measures. I was very cautious to that looking through these. Uh, the ad hoc proposed nothing in circulation. Circulation was done by your staff for pedestrian and bicycle. If there was something put in, it would be one or two small items. I'm available on Friday nights. If we're gonna start doing this, we're gonna have meetings, 
I'm not going to do it on my time during the day. We'll do it on your time. I mean, once again, we're into this process where these are simple words. I just beg staff, tell us how we can do this, not why we can't all the time. I feel like I'm walking back to when we started this 10 years ago. I feel like I'm almost looking at the zoning ordinance. It's not as hard as it's being made out to be. Thank you. Thank you for providing the report and the feedback. Um, any other questions from council? Any current direction? Councilmember Vega. Brian, I think it would help if we put together some sort of a tentative timeline for all this instead of leaving it open-ended. We don't have to do it tonight, but I mean, not, that's not what I'm asking for. But if we put some dates and times together, you know, subject to change, of course, uh, so we can see how much time this is going to actually take, I think it would be uh, conducive to us not to leave it open-ended, and I think to you also. That way we can get this thing done and reviewed. Absolutely, thank you. I just wanted to make one quick clarification. Um, I'm sorry if it came across uh, Council Member Starbuck that uh, the ad hoc committee made circulation um, comments. Um, that comment is specifically, like you said, the, the bike and ped plan, so that would be rolled into these amendments. So my apologies if it made it seem like the ad hoc committee made that comment. But the rest of them are, are, are accurate. So. Uh, I would concur with Councilmember Vega that building a timeline so we better understand how much time it will take and um, a, a, if nothing else, a guesstimate of, of the kinds of costs that would be involved is really important to um, better understand how we move this forward and address all of the concerns brought forward by the ad hoc and all of the necessary changes. Council Member Starbuck. Well, I'm gonna make a point here. We're gonna play this out until the very end of my term, I can feel, because if we can't have the public at a council meeting, we're certainly not gonna have them at a general plan review. There are some very definite complications to the COVID-19 protocols, unfortunately, and there is methodology. It unfortunately f won't be necessarily public in the room unless we find a much larger venue with much bigger space to do much more social distancing, and that is only at the county agreeing to that kind of environment, given uh, most of who's here is staff. So. Councilmember Storbeck. Uh, well, one more comment, you know, of course, COVID, COVID, whatever, maybe it'll be gone in November, but I have to say one of the things here that really upsets again is the city council ad hoc committee suggestions. Typically, the council doesn't make suggestions, we give direction, and so the wording was enough to trigger me right off the gate here. So unfortunately, the ad hoc is designed to provide suggestions and draft uh, recommendations, and then the full recommendation and discussion and direction comes actually from the full council. So the ad hoc, as I understand it, um, Mr. Malave, is simply to review and provide suggestions. Suggestions to the rest of the council to make the final decision. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think, um, you have support for developing a timeline to address these issues and um, a preliminary budget to help us better understand the cost of making the scope of changes that are being suggested. Any other comments? Seeing none, thank you so very much. Mr. Halverson. The next presentation is from our Management Service Director, Dean Albro, um, regarding street lighting rate schedules LS1. Dean Albro here, Management Service Director, Finance Director, whatever you want to call me. It was requested to bring the LS1 street lights back um, based upon the March 3rd uh, adoption of resolution 58814. Just a little brief history to back up. 
In 2011, they got a grant. They did some, but the big one was in 2014 where they replaced the majority of all the street lights. Um, you can see right there, that was how many they did and what, what uh, watt rating they did. Almost 2,500 uh, street lights were replaced. Um, I think it's important to note that um, they spent about $1.1 million in the, in the um, replacing all the eight high pressure sodium bulbs with the light emitting diode bulbs. And since then they've saved almost 988,000 of that. So they've almost paid for the whole replacement, saving about 180,000 a year. If you look at, I, I did a comparison here to try and get an idea of you know where those rates are calculated. Um, these are the two that are the closest, the two close to a 70 watt bulb. You break down those costs, uh, the standard, the mass, and the anchor are about $8.66 replacement cost. And the Cobra head for the high pressure sodium is about $5.85. You look at the LED, your standard's still going to be the same, $8.66. The Cobra head's a little bit cheaper. That's because they have a lot longer life and they need less labor and maintenance to maintain them. But basically, the main cost is really the, the street light itself, the pole, and not really the bulb. And you can see up there, the very top, you can see the energy cost that's associated with those two types of bulbs. If you go back to 2012 and you look at the rate, um, if I back up again, you can see what makes up that rate. If you look at the rate that they put in the resolution, it, it, it looks like to me it was just the energy cost. They didn't incorporate the, the standard and the Cobra head. Uh, if you see the two rates that I compared, you can get an idea of uh, what those rates are, how they're made up. Um, anyways, that's really all I had. It's really short. Um, conclusion, uh, you can direct me to come back and we can readjust it. Those are all based on 2014 rates. It'd be closer to 2180 for one of those bulbs, uh, the LED bulbs, today's cost. Or if you want, uh, one of the things I'm recommending is we put it inside the 21 and 23 biennial budget to do a rate study for electric. So that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Council Member Mosby. Thank you for, for bringing it. What I asked for years ago was this be done publicly because the way it was set forward, it, I was a utility commissioner way back when and they said no rate changes were happening, but thank you for digging deep to, to find out the analytics of what was going on and what they didn't do. And I guess at that meeting it was said that they were going to come back with that change of number, but thanks for filling in that gap. It was, very, um, it was very hard to follow, and, and I had to go through it a couple of times to figure out, okay, what happened there? I know you and I talked a lot about, and we thought the rate should have been a lot lower, but you, do, you dig and you figure out what was really made up the cost and kind of explains things a little bit. And the, the fixture itself is probably a lot less money now than it was six years ago. I mean, LED stuff seems to be coming down still, so... Um, I mean, you, would you bring it back during the budget cycle naturally, or? My goal was to incorporate rate studies for all water, electric, and um, wastewater. Uh, we're in the process of doing master fees, uh, the development impact fees, and solid waste fees, so I would like to keep coming back with rate studies so we make sure we're current on our rates. So you're coming back anyways? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for doing all that homework. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Mr. Albro? Seeing none, we will close staff presentations and come to oral communications on city matters that are not currently on the agenda. The number to call is 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC when your call is put through. Oral communications on city matters not currently on the agenda. You have three minutes maximum. Did we have any general oral communications, Madam Clerk? No, ma'am. Thank you. 
The number again is 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC. Seeing no one call in, we will close oral communication and bring it back to the council agenda. Before moving on with the rest of the agenda, um, we have had a request for the, um, from the chamber to move item five to beginning of new business, so just above um, item three. And if I have two supporting that to move it we need to decide now so that the public is aware before we continue with the agenda. So you have time to review that. Item number five is discussion of agreement with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce for economic development and business assistance services. And the chamber has requested we move it to the beginning of new business. Council Member Cordova. Um, I, I would be okay with supporting that. I need a microphone so that it's recorded. If I have a third. Microphone. I'll suggest we do that. Okay, thank you for the third, I appreciate it. So we will move item five above item three for the public to be aware of. Now we will move back to council request item number two, body worn cameras for the Lompoc Police Department. And we have Chief Mariani to present that. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. So back on June 16th at the uh, City Council uh, meeting, it was uh, requested that um, the department provide a staff report on body-worn cameras. So before I proceed, I want to give you a little background. Back in 2015, Longfoot Police Department first considered using body-worn cameras. And at that time, the price for the storage of data captured by the cameras was cost prohibitive. And the main reason for that was that uh, it was a storage issue and it was going to be quite costly. So due to the fact that it was going to be quite, quite an expense, it was decided to pursue in-car video. And so we went ahead and did that. So the city initially invested $136,712 for the WatchGuard dash camera technology. And so we adopted that, it was implemented in early 2016, and along with that, we also had to purchase a server to store all that data. Video data is very cumbersome or it takes a lot of space. So we initially, uh, it was allocated uh, $240,000 for 30 terabytes to store that data. So since 2016, that's what we've been doing when we when we activate the in-car video system, uh, it stores that video, we keep that video, and then we use it for both uh, criminal cases, administrative cases, and, and other requests that are, that are made. The WatchGuard system was installed in 15 police vehicles, including the community service vehicles. And uh, it is now entering its end of life phase. Uh, WatchGuard was purchased by another uh, competitive company, so that will come to its end of life phase in, at the end of this year. So as we looked um, for options to save money without giving up the quality or functionality of combining the purchase of, or replacement for in-car video, uh, we looked at several things. So it's no surprise to anyone there's been a large and, and strong call for police reform. And one of the, the um, ongoing things throughout the nation is, is to call for all departments to have body-worn cameras. 
and there's many agencies that do have them. Um, so we started doing the research uh, for body-worn cameras, and in doing that, we had to look at a product that would meet the physical demands of the police officer role, because the equipment has to be very resilient. Now, the good thing is that five years later, we have a better product, and it's available out there. So we, we got some we got a uh, quote from one of the competitive vendors uh, that provides this equipment to many law enforcement agencies within the state and around the nation. So the new, the new tool or the uh, equipment that we're looking at has really quality imagery. In addition to that, it also provides triggers. And why is that important? You've heard a lot of people say, hey, we want to see what happens when a police officer draws his weapon. Well, now the technology is such that when you draw your weapon, it, activate, it activates that body-worn camera. In addition to that, if they were to draw their, their taser, it would also do that. So uh, these, uh, these uh, devices are very advanced and they provide uh, a great deal of, of video evidence and recording of, of incidents. It also has a buffering capability. So let's say, for example, an officer is driving down the street and he sees a violation and he activates his red lights and sirens to pursue that vehicle or to make that stop. And let's say there's a pursuit or some incident. In the aftermath of that, because of the buffering uh, capability, it would allow us to go back, even though the emergency equipment hadn't been activated, to still capture what the initial violation was that prompted that incident. So that's also very beneficial. In considering uh, you know, body-worn cameras, one of the things uh, that's you know, a key consideration is what type of technology we're going to use for storage. And there's Wi-Fi capability, and then there's cellular. And the department is in favor of doing the cellular uh, storage uh, capability because it could be stored on the cloud. If we go to a Wi-Fi platform, that would require LPD to continue to store video in-house and this would be an additional cost. As I mentioned before, the server that we use for WatchGuard, the in-car video, was 240,000. Uh, preliminary estimates, it's, it's gonna be at least 500,000 for body-worn video because it's so much more. Another critical function to consider when implementing uh, body-worn cameras is the demand place on records and property staff. So, you know, several months ago when this whole discussion began, a lot of people came in and they, you know, brought in information, there were people who says, hey, you can get cameras for this amount. It's not so much the equipment that's expensive, it's the storage, uh, or not, not the storage, but the ability to, to provide on Public Records Act requests, and most agencies that have implemented body-worn cameras, they have units. So I looked at that for us, and that would take at least one sergeant, a police officer, and at least two uh, clerical uh, members to do the redaction and the review of tape. And, and just to give you uh, an, an insight as to how time consuming this, a 20 minute uh, traffic stop would take about four hours worth of work. And we have to do that because we have to meet the legal mandates uh, in order to release that, that uh, information and then it has to be reviewed, approved, and that's why you would need the added personnel. And we're gonna get a ton of requests if we were to implement it. So that's, that's why in our plan we included not only the, the uh, five-year program for, uh, uh, from a competitive vendor, as you see there on the third page, and as you look, as I, as I mentioned, the first year would be $115,000. And then the second year it would go to 58,000, 86,000 for the third year, 86,000 for the fourth year, and fifth year rather, and then a total of $517,000. Now it's also mentioned in here that we have spares. After the first year they would provide us spares in the event that some of that equipment gets damaged. We would have spares or backups that officers could use while, they, while that equipment's being repaired. The other thing is at the two and a half year juncture, all those cameras get replaced, and again at the five year program, so uh, with this particular company. 
The staffing increases, it would require one police sergeant, as I mentioned, to have a community affairs detail to deal with all these Public Records Act requests. Um, and that comes out with uh, the combined cost with benefits, it's 166,000 for a police sergeant, 133,000 for a police officer with the combined uh, benefit package as well, 82,000. Uh, 964 for each of the property records tax. So that's what it would entail. Um, Body-worn cameras would provide LPD with the capability of, of capturing critical video evidence for criminal and administrative investigations. It's really a great risk management tool. Uh, I have never been an opponent to body-worn cameras. Uh, I fully support them. Uh, the police association is in full support of them. But the big issue here is the cost, because we're talking about a million dollar investment. So that concludes my presentation, and I'm open to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, Chief, um, I, I guess the question is, all of our stationary cameras that we have in locations throughout town, we have to store that data the same way, correct? Yes. So. Is there a difference if somebody made a public records request to view what was ever on a camera? Or is there a different line there? Is it a whole different type of? Well, we're storing that as well. And, and it's going to be growing too. And we have to keep that uh, video evidence or, or those recordings for a minimum of two years. Some say it's one year, but to be safe, the standard in the industry or in the law enforcement profession and for, for most cities is to keep it for two years. So that, that takes a lot of storage as well. Right, I, I guess say I made a public records request because somebody saw me on one of these cameras and I wanted to see what they saw. So the same law would apply where you'd have to go in there and redact everything that that camera saw for the whole period that I was being questioned. Right, and the things that you have to redact is uh, uninvolved people, uninvolved vehicles. If you have minors, you may have to redact uh, certain things with the victim, depending on the age of the victim. So that's why it's such a cumbersome and, and lengthy and arduous task. Uh, the good thing is that with this, with this uh, proposal and with uh, this vendor who provided the, uh, the quote, they would provide the, the redaction software. And like I said, the more practical and cost efficient means for storage would be the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I didn't anticipate having to hire a whole staff specifically to back body cameras when yeah. this was brought up. I, is there anything in the foreseeable future that would change that something else would come up? It used well, to be, well, the body camera is not as clear. They're balanced. They, you know, they're not stable. We'd rather have the end car unit. Now the technology's changed. The, the situation in, on, in the country's changed. But now we've had a, a lot more, it seems like, to the body camera. And you're gonna capture everything. And it's a great volume of, of video recordings that we're gonna have. The, the challenge is, I wish it were simpler, but the legal mandates require uh, that we go through this process and then we have to really vet it and examine it before it's released to make sure that the city doesn't incur any unnecessary liability. And uh, that comes from you know, the legal opinions and the, and the lawyers who have also crafted the regulations for that that have ultimately been approved and passed. See, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of folks don't understand is that these kind of uh, programs, though very beneficial, there is a lot of cost to it. So, um, you know, this, this would be a priority for me if the money were available, uh, along with getting new radios as well too, which are two, two very critical equipment pieces that we need for the police department. But I would welcome body-worn cameras uh, if, if the money were available for it. But does, does everybody that's on patrol have to have one? Well, the good thing about it is, let's say you have an incident, you have an officer, you get multiple views, which is really important. If you just have one view, and, and that's the capability that this new system has. So if I show up at a call and my partner shows up, it'll automatically link and it'll, I also capture from his or her perspective, so you get all this additional, you know, footage that you need. I mean, it's a great system, um, but costly. 
Council Member Mosby. I really don't think we can't afford to not get these things. And as things, you know, like you said, it wasn't long ago federally they were talking about mandating and it's probably gonna come back anyways. And, and like you say, it definitely reduces the, the aggression um, on both sides. Right. I know when, when Chief Walsh here before, it was, I was the one who was pushing for the car cameras because he says it brought the aggression down by 90% um, on both sides, you know, so which is a good point. So we minimize litigation. Um, I know Prop 64 has a significant amount of grants coming potentially available, that 20% tax that the state's charging. You know, I, I hate doing employees under grants, but maybe there's other uh, aspects, but there could be, uh, you know, uh, several millions of dollars coming to the city annually uh, with what we've got there, but I definitely think this is one of the things that should be first in line. Um, it would be a wise investment, uh, and from a risk management perspective, makes all the sense in the world. And, and maybe maybe not right in the front of coming down in, in, the, in the next budget cycle, but definitely I think as we see more and more of these new businesses open up, you'll see more and more revenues coming that way that um, hopefully you can get to that. Okay. And I think there's a grant available right now, right? But there's 453,000 or something that we could. For, um, no, I'm not aware of that for one. public safety on that, no? Okay. I'm not aware of any uh, public safety grants for body cameras right now. Okay. I, I, real quick, Mary, I, I have talked to Dean a little bit about the situation and as we move into the new budget cycle that we can start trying to look at how we can afford this too, but I don't want to stop the discussion. Councilmember Cordova. <clears throat> so that was going to be one of my questions is that is there an opportunity for some grants that we could pursue um, in light of what's going on nationwide? I don't know if that's something that we need to continue to look at. Um, but it seems to me, Chief, that regardless of whether we get body cams or not, we're still facing an issue with the end of life um, of the current police uh, vehicle cameras. And so what what is our plan to address that even if we don't have, because budget talks will begin next year or we'll, we'll go into budget season next year, but what is the plan right now for that? And, and does this um, proposed physical impact, does this include also, I guess, the incorporation of replacement or whatnot of the existing vehicle cameras or is it just for body cameras? It would be a joint or a binary system. It would be both in-car video and body worn. Okay. Uh, based upon this quote, so it would be both. As for the the fact that a watch guard has been uh, overtaken or it's, it's been bought out by another competitor. We're looking to see what their cost is gonna be. And normally what happens when somebody takes over a company, they're gonna be charging a little bit more okay. uh, because it was a good product and that's why they bought it. And it's, it's one of the main uh, video companies that purchased okay. it. <clears throat> and do you have an actual date of when um, this will actually take place? I know it says by end of year, but is it is it like December 31st or is it do we have an actual date? I, of I believe it's month? the end of the year, but I haven't heard a firm date yet. And so we'll be we'll be also contacting uh, the vendor regarding what they project will be the cost as well. Okay, and then who is currently managing the city cameras um, and the watch guard footage that is, is gathered? The watch guard footage is stored in a server at the police station, the 30 terabyte server that I indicated, and we have a full-time dedicated IT uh, person that's assigned to the police department, and then the footage or the video is managed by the Wi-Fi department of the city. Okay, thank you for that clarification, Chief. I appreciate that. So, by the looks of it, the first year we would need the half a million in order to stand up the initial purchase uh, contract, the initial payment for the first year of the contract, and the staffing recommendations. Um, 
is the IT individual um, seen as somebody who's just added the additional work of the current management of, that, of those tech records, or would that person be considered part of your positions for this? No, he would not be part of that new okay. team. Okay. All right, thank you for that information. Um, again, you're right, we should not fund any of the positions on a grant, um, so um, we would need to really find the revenue. I, I do know that we returned three positions to you for law enforcement. Um, and would that be something you'd be willing to consider if you could get the police techs sooner? Because I think that's different training and different background and different testing, isn't it, the police techs? Well, the three positions that we have to fill um, still require us to put them in the academy. And okay. So, those three positions were probably two years away from seeing any difference right, in. Right. And I was ecstatic about the fact that we started six in the academy uh, four weeks ago, but uh, the most recent report is we're down to four. Yeah. So we've lost two already. And when, that was from about a pool of 70 to 80 candidates to get those six. And they've never had six in an academy class. In the time I've been here, I don't think they've ever had six uh, academy trainees going to the police academy one time so so i guess my question would be since it might be difficult to fill those additional three positions because you're still having trouble filling the positions that are currently open and, and trying to fill could potentially we reassign that to maybe the police records tech because again even if they went through the academy they're coming in at a different level than you would as an officer if i understand correctly because of the what they're doing isn't out in the field it's working behind a computer and understanding the software and that sort of thing. I don't want to commit myself to that just now. Okay. And the reason for that is we have testing planned for police officers on September 12th. Okay. And the reports I'm hearing from HR are very promising that we have a potential candidate pool of 90 people. That's awesome. So uh, my, my goal will be to fill police officer positions first and foremost. Okay, I would still like to, if that's not as successful, to consider sure. some of some flexibility for you if we can find the funds to move forward on this sooner than end of year, especially if WatchGuard new parent comes back and says it's going to be more expensive than this. I think we need to definitely pivot sooner rather than later. And I'll be back sooner if that's the case. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, We'll open for public comment on this item, 805-875-8201. Um, Please remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC. Madam Clerk, did we have any written communications? You did. You received one from Mr. Ron Fink. Um, it was delivered to the entire council and to staff, and it was... Uh, put on the website. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, for the public, Mr. Fink did support the purchase of body cams and um, encouraged us to do it as soon as we possibly could. Again, the number to call in is 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC if your call is put through. 805-875-8201. 8201. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hey, this is Shondell Malcolm, uh, Lompoc resident. Um, thank you for having this agenda item on. Um, this was one of the, the requests that I know I had on June 16th when I came to the city council meeting. Um, I definitely think that this protects the police department and it also protects the community members. Um, I find it hard to believe that we're talking about cost when the city has just given LPD a 2% increase. Uh, LPD was just... Uh, bragging about their new SUVs, um, and we are currently spending money to install cameras around Lompoc when all of these things could be, we could refocus and have a different allocation of money and put this towards body cams, which I feel is 
um, very important for our community. Um, you know, and we see incidents that are happening all over the country. Um, Los Angeles Police Department had a fatal shooting last night. None of the police officers had body cameras on. And that's something that could have been very um, beneficial to them. We have uh, Vallejo that is um, under scrutiny right now because their officers have bent badges for their fatal shooting. And not to say that that's happening in Lompoc, but we see the aggression that we're talking about that dropped 90% just from having the in-car um, video. So again, having these body cams reduces that that aggression again. Um, we have Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office that has an officer with five fatal shootings, five fatal deaths. You know, no body cams. And with our Longfoot Police Department, we have police officers that are bragging about breaking people's ribs and breaking people's eye sockets and the fact that they want to shoot people in the face. And I've heard threats of shooting dogs. And I've seen the police officers and I've heard them talk about it, about throwing away people's property when they arrest them, which is a violation of their rights. And they do that because they don't want to log it. So there are many, many reasons to have these body cams so that it protects our community. I came and I spoke at the city council meeting and discussed the fact that I've had weapons drawn on me four times. I have no criminal record. I have never been arrested. We had another gentleman that had weapons drawn on him three times. I think the body cam should be a priority and something that should be done immediately. Thank you. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Thank you. Hi, this is Leah from Lompoc, and um, that last call in person was great. Really think about what he said. Um, it's really important. So anyway, a lot of people, you know, keep worrying about defunding the police, um, but the majority on this council has been defunding the police for years. We actually need to start funding the police intelligently. So. And please stop hoping and relying on grants and unicorns. Find the money and start taking the peace and safety of this town seriously. Thank you. Have a good night. Once again, the number to call is 805-875-8201. Eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one, and remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC when your call is put through. Seeing no additional calls, we will close public comment and bring it back to council. Council Member Cordova. Um, Dean, I have a question. And um, with the vacancies that the police department has had um, throughout this budget, is there any money in the, um, in the police department to begin anything like this or to at least cover a portion of this or at least maybe the hardware and then maybe th by the time we get to the budget we could consider the police the staffing portion of it i don't know i'm just trying to think outside the box here well currently when we passed the budget we had uh, about 1.3 million in, in held vacancies um that's when i came back in june i tried to get that lowered so we could actually hire officers and that pretty much puts us at a balanced budget right there. So if we were entertaining something like this, we'd have to use fund balance, and I don't think we're gonna have any fund balance as of June 30th, I'm not sure. Um, might be a wait and see, but uh, it, it would be hard based upon the budget that I'm seeing right now. 
Um, but I think the next budget cycle would be probably a different story. Okay, thank you, Dean. This is extremely important, especially with WatchGuard um, sunsetting and most likely to be very expensive. So I think it's one of those priorities we need to um, look hard at the dollars and where we are spending them and really try and focus on what needs to be done within the city rather than to outside the city. So um, th this is, this has long-term impacts, not just for the department, but for the city as a whole. And, and I think we're making a grave mistake if we don't dig deep and figure out where this funding comes from. So hopefully um, staff can put their hard hats on and pull out the shovels and we dig a little deeper to see if we can't fund this sooner rather than later, even if it was adjust a couple of texts with the current officers overseeing them until we could dedicate um, full-time staff in um, the next budget round. So anyway, Councilmember Cordova. Another question, um, City Manager, you had mentioned, I think when we initially discussed this, uh, this topic and it was discussed to be brought back um, with the full report to Council, um, you had mentioned something along the lines of, um, federal stimulus or something that the city was waiting on. Can you give us an update on that? Because I know you had mentioned that might be a possibility that we could, you know, use some of those funds for, for, for helping us in this particular area. Right. We're supposed to be getting back per the CARES Act, if, if they continue forward, about $540,000. Um, we're working on that right now. In fact, we're, our first report to them is due, I believe it's this Friday. And they're giving it to us in pieces, it's not all at once. And then we have to be able to show that we've used it all for COVID. Okay. And um, out of the 540, we're able to show close to 800,000 that has gone towards COVID expenses. So we far surpassed what we need to do. Um, but it is a um, essentially a reimbursement for what was already spent, but that would be coming in and that would be available to use in different manners. Okay, but it has to be related to COVID. Um, it's supposed to re it's supposed to be reimbursing what we've already spent, okay. and so we've already spent it b due to COVID. So I, see. I can look into it. It might get in that gray area, but it's we've already spent it, so it's reimbursing us, which men means that it's back in our account to then spend it in a different manner. But I, d I just need to verify that I follow all their steps. So I believe that this is just one of the things that obviously is a priority for us as a city council to address and as a city to make happen for our police department. As Chief Mariani said, there is the issue of radios, there is other issues, there's the issues of staffing. I recently sat down with Chief Mariani and I also sat down with Officer Arias and, um, you know, to discuss what... Um, what does the succession plan look like for the police department? How do we get our gang unit back in order? How do we get our, our traffic unit back in order? How do we get our criminal? So right now, uh, there's so many needs and all are a priority, um, but I would hate to see this one thing not or be left just open out there in the air again, as Mayor Osborne said, to the future and not knowing so is there at least an opportunity for us to bring this back um, by the end of the year? And then that way we get the information from Chief um, with regards to the cost for um, the new watch guard system that, or, or the, the, the changes to the watch guard system and what that would require. And maybe by then we have a little bit more information uh, from staff that they could bring back a possibility of where we could maybe, you know, put our resources together and be able to make something like this, um, you know, start funding something like this. So you're looking for maybe a report in early December? Yes. I think it needs to be brought back and I think it needs to be discussed in early December, even before we go into next year, um, if, if we have the information by then, you know. Um, but again, I just want to make it clear, for me, this is not 
the only priority, and this is not the number one priority. I feel that the department has numerous priorities that need to all be looked at and addressed. Um, this is just one of them. Councilmember Mosby. Ms. Elicorn, can CDBG money be used for any part of this? Uh, aside from the 20% that we use for admin, it doesn't really fit. You have to have a benefit to low mod nexus and you have to document income or census. So it would be very challenging, similar to when we were funding code enforcement with CDBG. It's hard to uh, only document the body cameras worn in the low mod areas and only document that type of information. So, and again, we only get 400,000 a year. 20% gets taken off, then 15%, that leaves you, leaves you with about 300,000 maybe that we do parks, so park improvements. So it would, it, it's not a qualified capital project. It's not a fixed building for low mod people or ADA. I know, I know you were able to do with code enforcement, so I was just wondering. Code enforcement is called out specifically in the CDBG regulations as an eligible deal. Just like facade improvement is specific. Um, when you start getting into capital purchases, it gets fuzzy and you really have to have that strong nexus. So it, it would definitely be a stretch. I've never heard of any other jurisdiction using CDBG for body cameras. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So back to council member Cordova's request, I'm guessing the best we could promise is as soon as you hear back from WatchGuard, you will try and get on the agenda to bring us back an update on what that cost might be and how it might impact moving towards this sooner instead of picking a particular date in the next couple of months. Is that correct? We can do that and we'll have some better numbers as we move into the budget cycle too. So we'll be able to see, is there any capacity um, remaining for the next budget cycle? Is that helpful? Okay. So no specific date, just monitoring for when we have as much information that Chief can bring us back when he has it. Thank you. All right, the next item will be item number five. We will move yeah. it forward. The discussion of the agreement with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce for Economic Development and Business Assistance Services. And that is our city manager. Mayor? Yes. I'm sorry, but before we start this item, I wanted to uh, let the council know of an oversight I had earlier. Um, Lompoc has a unique rule in its city council handbook that states that in order to move an item on the agenda to a different place on the agenda, it requires a super majority vote of the council. So that would be four votes tonight rather than the three that we have right now. All right. So um, if, we can, if we have one more vote of another council member, then we can move that item number five up. But if we don't, then we need to continue with the scheduled agenda. All right. Council Member Mosby. I'll give you the fourth vote. Thank you for the fourth vote. The item is moved ahead. Um, the item is number five. Our city manager will begin the presentation. Oops. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So um, back in, I didn't write the date down. Um, once the council is starting to decide what to do with the new uh, proof sales tax and um, the three different areas that were brought forth were to refund or reestablish the three police officers, the 1.75 parks uh, FTEs to help with parks, and also reestablishing um, re the contract with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce for um, different types of work, tourism, business establishment, and whatnot. Um, during that time, I did reach out to the chamber and ask them to um, oh, and also with the new agreement, they wanted the council wanted to put in economic development as a new portion of the contract. So I did reach out to the um, LVCC and ask them to submit a new contract and just a little bit of history. The city has actually been contracting with the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce since 1928 um, when they were doing advertising and marketing for the city since, since that time. 
Um, so the new one is part of the agenda and it lists the different types of established um, services that they were doing before with the addition of the economic development. Um, I didn't want to go through the whole agenda, but I thought it best instead of the council at the time said I could go ahead and just sign the agreement, but I thought it best to bring forth, since it is a new agreement, it didn't, it, it's new from what it was in the past for all those many, many years. So um, it is here for your discussion. I did ask the chamber executive director to be here. So Amber is here to answer any questions or if she wants to make a discussion or given any input on it, she's here also. Ms. Wilson, would you like to step to the microphone and present your portion? Good evening, Council. Um, so yes, when we started talking about um, the new city contract, we, we found it um, prudent for us to create something that was going to be a better arrangement and a better value to the city and to the community. So as requested, we put together a proposed contract that I submitted for you, um, including economic development and business assistance services. Um, so you have that in front of you. Um, the proposed city contract is a scope of services agreement between the city and the chamber that addresses the need for economic development in Lompoc while maintaining quality of life events, tourism efforts, and business assistance services for the business community. So you have the contract in front of you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Starbuck. You know, Amber, thank you. I'm looking at page three of nine on this agreement, recreation and wine industry. Um, I, I'm thinking at this point it may be prudent because the only thing that's floating us around here tax-wise anymore is cannabis, if we could include cannabis in there with the wine industry. Okay, that's an item that I could discuss with my board. Council Member Cordova. So um, I have a few questions, Amber. Um, since the uh, loss of the funding by the city to the chamber, um, what has been the state of the chamber? So when we initially lost funding, um, we had to eliminate one full-time position, which was the bookkeeping position. So I absorbed that position myself. Um, so we've been maintaining um, through um, our non-dues revenue, which is events and fundraisers, and then of course membership and membership growth and renewal. Um, it's been a bleed, a slow bleed, and then of course COVID came and basically eliminated our, our income stream almost 100%, at least through March, April, May. So membership renewals are starting to come back in, which is a positive, but certainly we're operating in a negative balance each month. So. I was able to obtain an idle loan for the chamber um, due to COVID, so we've been hanging on by a thread. I did have to eliminate my one staff person from full time to 15 hours. So it's been a struggle. We've had to pivot everything we do to uh, basically be a COVID resource um, and do the best we can and the best I can to kind of maintain you know, what the chamber does to serve our business community, but it's absolutely a struggle with limited resources and limited staff. And um, if, if uh, you know, this service agreement was accepted today. Um, does it call for additional positions um, to, to be able to manage the economic development aspect of it? Because I know that the staff report calls for um, and says, you know, it'll be for the money, which is the same amount of money, to be clear, which you got the chamber used to get, correct? Correct. Um, but now we're adding an element to it that is economic development. Is there a uh, foreseen need on your, um, in your plan to add additional staff to be able to meet the, the, new, the yes. new demands or the new economic development portion of it, yeah, of so the agreement? Yes, yeah, so the model when I started based on the funding here in this contract was three full-time people. So that's, that model's gonna look a little bit different now that we have taken off some of, the, um, some of the items in the former contract and added the economic development. So I do see basically hiring an economic development person, um, whether that's part-time or full-time, we're gonna gauge that as we go because that's gonna be dependent on workflow. So at this point, because we don't have a frame of reference as to what that's gonna look like for the chamber, 
Um, we'll work out those details, but at a minimum 20 hours, I'd like to hire an economic development point person so, so, so the city can refer all the inquiries to us and we can field those in that way. And then, and then that person would also be an expert, hopefully, on the subject of economic development. Okay, so for, for me, and I will just say, um, I think that the Chamber is, an, is, an, is a great organization and I've supported it from the beginning of my career. Um, in the hospitality industry here in Lompoc. Um, however, I do have some concerns. I do, I do have some concerns that the same amount of money that would be given to the chamber from what they used to get, um, which already only had you being able to be staffed with yourself and, and another person, um, would really, that, that the chamber, and, and with all the components that we just talked about, the effects that COVID and everything else has had, and even the loss of, of the revenue going in from the city into the chamber, um, that, that there would actually be room for the hiring of an additional person. And for me, a part-time position to handle economic development for the city is just not enough. So I just wanna state that those are some of my concerns that I do not feel that um, the 108,000 would be enough. I, I don't think that, um, I don't know that, I, I don't think initially that the chamber would be able to really successfully, I guess, produce the results um, for that economic development portion of the services. Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, just real quick, Amber, when would you be able to get back um, to the council on your board's decision to include cannabis in the uh, recreation and industry support? I actually have a board meeting tomorrow morning at 7.30 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Councilmember Vega. Amber, we've had discussions uh, with the city here. I don't think we ever came to a, a firm decision here as far as the Economic Development Com Committee through the city. Does that element also include um, the chamber also taking over that element or being able to manage that and use it all, obviously as a, an additional, as some assistance there with you. I went through a neighboring city, city of Santa Maria has Economic Development Committee. They go through the chamber. It's actually a better tool, I think, because it allows the city to do what they need to do. And, you know, I'd like your input on that. You're not trying to throw something on you, but I think that if you're gonna have this element in here, it's also, it would be prudent for you guys just to have that committee or commission, if you deem it uh, valuable, to go through you guys, instead of having the city over here run it. Sure. So the city uh, Santa Maria Chamber, I think it's about a half a million dollars uh, to do economic development. So to uh, Councilman, Council Member Cordova's point, um, certainly, we, if you look at the contract, there are a lot of other elements in the contract outside of economic development. So if the city wants us to come to an arrangement where we are simply doing economic development, and that's all we're doing as a partnership with the city for $108,000, and, and that you feel that that's what you want us to focus on, then we can make revisions to the contract. As to your question about having the Economic Development um, Council under the umbrella of EDC, uh, um, on the, the chamber, I mean, I think that's appropriate, and that's something that we would consider doing. Yeah, because I think that's the direction it would go to. Um, I'm not sure where we're at with the city manager, where we're going with this. I know that was a proposal, but now that we have this, we might as well clarify whether the committee or commission would be a, have a lateral move over to that area. I think that moving that would, I want to take that up to the council about moving a commission since you oversee the commissions. Right, right. I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, after looking at the general plan, it looked like it's an easy move, but uh, I'd like to make sure that we go through the motions here to get to that decision. That's why I'm asking Amber, and I'm looking at, yes, they have a budget, but there's still a, a volunteer commission also and committee. So I think it would be a better element and a better resource for you guys having that think tank. It under is the something we've discussed. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mosby. So I think it would be prudent to move forward as we are with this contract and some of the suggestions could be uh, amendments could be accomplished with the city manager, I believe, on some of these things that we're talking about. That way, I understand uh, time is of importance right now. So tick tock, right? So I don't want to overcomplicate, but I, I agree with uh, what Council Member Vega said, uh, have that committee come with you in the think tank aspect, but I think those things that we can modify. I don't want to necessarily delay this, but I definitely want to add those things. Councilman Starbuck had one as well that we probably want to 
get added onto the agreement as well as obviously you have to run it through your other chains in the command cycle too but um i, I definitely would support the the movements of uh, our, our suggestions of council member vega and as well as starbucks council member cordova well i realize that we still have to go to public comment but I, I'm, I'm gonna say this, I really feel that we just got done talking about how we don't have funding to fund some serious issues that, that, that our police department, or serious needs that our police department has amongst other departments throughout City Hall. Um, I, I would have no problem, and I have no problem with the Chamber of Commerce, and I would have no problem if this item would have came back as it was prior, giving the chamber back their money for what services they've provided in the past and for what we've done with, with the chamber in the past. But to try to pass this off, in my opinion, as economic development, I think it is false, I think it is misleading, and I think it is irresponsible to put that kind of pressure on the Chamber of Commerce when, when um, the chamber president just stated that they are barely hanging on and they are doing their best to service the businesses in this community. And now we're also going to give them the, the commission, or the Economic Development Commission, um, because you know we want to package this up and sell it to the public as economic development. I do not believe, and, and Amber, it is not a reflection of you or what your department or your, your organization is doing, because I think you guys do an amazing job of trying to promote business in Lompoc, but I think when we're talking about economic development and what the city needs, it is something completely different in my opinion. I sat, I've sat for weeks and actually months since I started on this council and looking at what our budget used to look like in 2017, and we actually had an economic development component. And I don't want to be schooled on the reasons why we don't have it and how we spent $200,000 or whatnot on all the things that used to be, but the fact that our organizational chart reflected an economic development department and it reflected um, components in there that covered our ability to be able to generate revenue or generate business into this community and looking at it now and knowing that there is nothing there. There's no trace of it. It does not say under community development. It does not say economic development anywhere on here. So I just feel that it is ingenuous and it is false and I don't particularly agree with it. Councilman Rea. Well, thank you for your comments. I don't agree with your uh, analysis of the Economic Development Committee and the Commission. I think they're all valuable. I think without guidance, without a set plan, without goals, without expectations, you can blame the council if you like, but there's been zero growth in Lompoc. We're going through a COVID entity. We need, this chamber needs help also with their think tank to place it over there. It's within the general plan. It is done in the city of Santa Maria. The, the Economic Development Committee does not get paid. So obviously you're on the Economic Development Committee. So of course I understand that. We all want economic development, but I don't believe that we're actually qualified to name it. I think the chamber would be more qualified to take that on. Councilmember Cordova. I've been a part of the Santa Maria market. I understand, and we just said, the, Santa Maria, the city of Santa Maria gives a half a million dollars to their chamber to support them for economic development. You are not offering her that. You are offering her the same $108,000 that she got before, and on top of that, you're packaging a, an additional deal on her back, which I do not feel is responsible, and I don't know that this chamber is gonna be able to do it. And when they fail, what are we gonna do? Come back and, and give them a lashing or take back their money again? It's irresponsible. Council Member Vega. I don't think that's fair, that analogy that you just presented. You know, I've been a part of this council for a long time. It's not the council's fault that we haven't moved forward and we haven't had any growth. Economic development for our North County, all the economists say we've had negative growth here in Lompoc. We haven't moved forward at all. We need to move forward. Economic development is a key element, but it's not anything that you can point a finger at where you throw more money at it. We're going through a pandemic right now. What do you want to do? We don't want to throw additional money, but we do have the think tank. I think Amber has a skill set that she can utilize this volunteer committee who doesn't even meet right now 
to help us move forward with ideas. I understand you're part of Explore Lompoc and you're tied to it, but let's think uh, reasonably about allowing the Economic Development Committee to survive and to help Lompoc, to go and meet the businesses, to use statistics, the saying that businesses that are thriving, we're giving, sometimes we give awards to, to uh, businesses that are failing. Nobody goes over there and gets a report card on how they're doing. All they do is take credit for businesses to start up, but as soon as you're a statistic, you disappear off the face of the earth. We have presentations that say, look, we open this many businesses. We take credit for business licenses that are open when we had no part in, in opening them. So I, I feel that Amber would be the best place to, to actually manage the Economic Development Committee. They're actually part of it. They're at Old Town Lompoc. We, we, we want Lompoc to be successful, but we have to have a plan. There's no plan here at City Hall for economic development. Councilmember Cordova. So here's what really gets me. And, and again, um, Councilmember uh, Vega keeps saying it when he says, let's give the chamber the opportunity to survive. Exactly, then call it what it is. Give them back their money for what we're giving them back their money for so that they can, we can help them survive. But do not give them additional responsibility that they may not be able to meet because they're barely able to survive with what they had. And, and they've also had uh, impacts from COVID. Um, we sat here in April and I pled with this council and I said, let's not lock in the, the tax, the 1% tax into the CalPERS. Let's give it one year. So if you're going to sit there and talk about, you know, ideas and, and how we can improve and, and, and have a fighting chance, then that's, that's the responsibility. I disagree that it's not this council's responsibility to figure out ways to best use the resources that we have. We decide, we, the, the majority of this council made the decision to, to set aside that money and lock us in without being responsible enough and waiting and adopting a one year. All I asked for was one year internal policy for us to deal with this COVID pandemic and, and this council decided not to do it. I have no problem giving the chamber back their money. What I have a problem with is packaging it up. I already said what I said. I think that it's really important that we bring this back to answering any questions by Ms. Wilson if she can answer any of the questions and then going to public comment because this discussion can continue after public comment. If Council Member Vega would allow that to happen. Um, I just have one comment. It's not uh, directed toward Councilwoman Cordova. I know she's passionate about what she feels and our direction and we're, we're all basically going and want to go in the same direction. But I'd like the path to move the, the Economic Development Committee. I'd like it clarified. Councilman Mosby, you said, hey, this is the direction we gotta go. What is the path? Do we have to make a motion to have that considered in a future meeting or what do we do right now? I need a little direction on that. At the moment, we need to go to public comment before we make any motions. Thank you. Thank you. We will now open the line for public comment. The number to call is 805-875-8201. Please remember to mute your TV, PC, radio when your call is put through. The item for comment is the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce Economic Development and Business Assistance Service contract, returning 108,000 per year or 216,000 to the chamber. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. I'm sorry, we're having a hard time hearing you. Is your TV uh, on? Hello? Do you hear me? We can hear you. Would you mind turning off? Do you have a TV or radio on in the background? This higher voice is in the background. Is your TV on? Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. You just Man, you told me that, too. I'm going to turn it off for now. Yeah, I'm sorry. Man, you told me that, too. I'm going to turn it off for now. My TV's off. Much better. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, am I 
on now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, I'm Frank Signorelli, native of Lompoc, and I'm calling to heartily agree with Councilwoman, um, well, God, I, now my, I draw a blank. But anyway, she is so right. Anybody that's been in business, you know, you, you, you work on the budget. You work on what you have, have to work with. And so when you – things go, go slow, and they do go slow and slow down, you, you uh, arrange, rearrange your business. And you just can't have somebody come in and tell you, well, you can go ahead and stay in business, but you've got to do this and this and this and this. Pretty soon you've gone bankrupt because you can't uh, do what, what they want you to do. You know, it just isn't fair. That they that and I've been on the chamber board. I've been on a lot of other boards, and you're always dealing with the budget, and you're always trying to stay uh, keep things going. And you can look at Lompoc has never been gone ahead as much as Santa Maria has because they can't keep up with what they need to do. And I don't think it's right to put all this on the chamber of commerce. Thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Jeremy Ball. I am a local citizen, also serve as the chair of the Chamber of Commerce. And I wanted to give a quick, uh, some feedback to a couple of the comments, and specifically to Mr. Starbuck. Um, we're, we're proud at the Chamber to have a couple of cannabis members, so we'll definitely talk about including them in the verbiage that you requested. And to Ms. Uh, Ms. Cordova's point about, you know, sort of uh, packaging this together, um, at the end of the day, the Lompoc Chamber of Commerce wants to make sure one way or another that we continue the discussion of economic development. So uh, while, you know, I personally may have preferred that we <laughs> keep what we had in terms of the economic development department, um, if we need to shift the conversation, we just want to make sure that that still happens. Um, and then real quick, if I may, I had a quick letter I wanted to, to read. Uh, hello, Mayor, Council Members, and citizens of Lompoc. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for a few moments on both the history and future of the Lompoc Valley Chamber of Commerce. First off, our chamber has been around for over 100, 117 years. It actually launched the same year that the Wright brothers took to the skies with their maiden flight. Our local chamber has played a significant role in the development of Lompoc. Back in the day, our local leaders had a vision of doing things a little differently. While most chambers were focused solely on retail sales, those who collaborated around the idea of a chamber here in Lompoc realized that the only way that business could thrive is if the entire community could prosper. Today, we at the chamber are still guided by this principle. The last few years, if not the last few months, have brought significant challenges to our community. These challenges cannot be solved by the city or the chamber of loan, Alone. That said, if we build towards a shared approach and bring all hands on deck, we'll have the chance to figure it out. I truly believe that we have a golden opportunity to set in motion a new and fresh approach to meeting the challenges of economic development. We shouldn't plan to reinvent the wheel completely, but instead we should use and look to emulate best practices from other successful chambers and cities. With the city as our partner, we believe that we could and can dial in an approach that is effective, equitable, and transparent. While there may be opportunity to, while there will be opportunity to develop every detail, the chamber must answer the most fundamental question. Is the city of Lompoc ready to commit to a new relationship with the chamber? Look, we've had a long and storied history that goes back multiple generations. I am hopeful that we can renew our shared commitment. And I can attest that with new and diverse voices on our board, and exceptional leadership by our CEO, Amber, during very complicated times, we are inspired to roll up our sleeves and help Lompoc answer the call for thoughtful and sustainable economic development. Thank you for your time. Were there any written communications? Yes, ma'am, you received something from Ron Fink. It was delivered to the entire council and staff, and it was uh, provided on the website. Thank you. You're welcome. The number to call is 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC 
when your call is put through. The number again is 805-875-8201. Seeing no additional calls, we will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion. Um, I would have to say that I fully support the chamber, and I know it's been a very hard time for you, and it's a very hard time for all of us, but given the prior discussion and needing to scrimp and save and try and find the funds that we need to fund cameras and radios and all kinds of equipment in police department, additional issues that we have in trying to reopen our rec department and provide support to the parks in our community and the fact that this community supported the one cent sales tax and are going to see no immediate benefits to that because we have not set any money aside for that. I, I have a hard time providing an outside entity a hundred and eight or two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars in total until we start the 21-23 budget discussion. I really think that this is the kind of funds we need to hold back and put towards the kinds of resources we need in our uh, public safety and in our parks and rec department to return the community um, to a quality of life that they are lacking. I realize that I, of all people up here, am passionate about economic development. It is really important. At this current time, it is not a priority for us quality of life, making sure that people are safe and uh, our departments are safe and they can respond to the issues that those that voted for and support the sales tax see some benefit to improvements either in the rec department or at the parks. It's really difficult for me to support something that is um, an outside entity that itself I know it's struggling. I'm, I'm glad you qualified for some of the PP loans and are finding new and improved ways to provide service to your current membership and that I think the biggest focus for the chamber right now is to actually regroup and focus on your membership and figure out what membership asks of you and how you can survive and not necessarily that the city um, sustains an outside entity when we have a lot we need to sustain within our own uh, boundaries. So I, I find it difficult to um, support something when our prior discussion was needing at, at the very least a half a million dollars to move forward on new body cameras and knowing we need new radios and other things for our police department in order to protect all of our community, not just a potentially new business community. Council Member Cordova. I think Council Member Mosby was first. Oh, thank you. Council Member Mosby. Surprise. First, Amber, let me say, you know, during what's going on in the, the COVID and such, you guys have, have really stepped up and you helped to assist the businesses to get open, to keep the jobs here, to keep money coming and flowing, which is what the Chamber is supposed to do, uh, and, you know, help out in that assistance. And, and you guys have done a good job um, during the, some trying times. Uh, you know, fortunately, Old Town Market, we didn't make that, which is definitely one of the big hits that you guys do. And some of the monies that you bring and stimulate in offsets and brings money so we can afford these other items like cameras and stuff that we need for the officers. Um, you did work your, your tail off to help get this sales tax measure passed as well. Um, you were very supportive of this. And I, I had made the commitment as well that, that you know, this passes and stuff, this was one of the things that I felt we needed to fund back and tie in a few other items with the city. You know, historically in the past, what's got us in this position is not just the COVID emergency, but we created in the last five or six years, 17 new general fund jobs in the city. And it really stepped on us hard and it made it difficult to keep funding the public safety support that we needed to. We did bring in three officer positions. That was another commitment I said I would do. 1.75 parks members that we brought in. Um, a lot of what the chamber does, and hopefully we can get some more of the doors open so that you can bring more people to this town and connect the dots. I think you have a good starting plan here to coordinate and put something together and bring some teeth to bring viability to you for well into the future. Um, I, I, I know it's gonna be trying initially, starting up how you're gonna progress through this. Um, I did make the suggestion for the economic development to, to align with you. 
And if you went back historically, what the city of Lompoc had done is it started, including the chamber funding was on top, but we started with a, a, a minuscule budget of 150 to 200,000 dollars. That soon grew to $700,000 a year that was being spent on economic development. And it was difficult to really figure what, what we got out of it, but we definitely, when we came time of tightening the belt and where we needed to do, because we burned up our reserves to get us where we were. So I appreciate you being patient. I appreciate you putting this together like this and definitely um, can support moving forward. There's a couple items that could be added on, as, as mentioned, which I believe the city manager can, at, at you know, approval of your board, to bring them together, but I think you guys can finalize that. But I think it's very important, because this money you're borrowing has got to be repaid. It's not a grant. So I think it's important and, and prudent that we, we connect the dots and finalize this tonight with some potential amendments. Councilmember Cordova. Um, I, I think that this needs to be looked at during our budget season. Um, I don't think that this needs to be done tonight. I do think that there are other pressing items that the city um, needs to look at that are, um, in my opinion, life safety items. Um, I, I, I agree that quality of life is important, but until we understand that in order to be able to give our residents quality of life, we need to produce some revenue into the city. And um, to me, to say that, you know, $750,000 was funded to economic development in the past in the prior years, but now we don't have anything going to that. Um, again, I just, I think it's too much of a task um, to give to the chamber and, and consider that you're gonna have the kind of results that we need to be able to produce the kind of economic development that Lompoc needs to generate the revenues to give our residents quality of life. Um, so I, I personally think that this needs to be moved to our budget season and discussed at that time and be brought back at that time. Councilmember Mosby. See no other lights on, I make the motion to approve this with the discussion coming back with your board and the city manager for the two items that was discussed here um, with Councilmember Vega and Councilmember Starbuck. I'll give you a second. So just to be clear about the motion, you're authorizing the city manager to agree on language in the contract about uh, adding cannabis to the list of um, businesses and also to bring the Economic Development Commission under the Chamber of Commerce's umbrella and, uh, okay. Correct. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 3-2. And now we'll go back to item number three, the adoption of resolution number 6360, parentheses 20, to establish one hour restricted parking zone at 200 East College Avenue. And that would be our senior civil engineer, Stefan Meyer. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, engineering staff has been asked by Mr. Tom Hinkins, owner of Hinkins Group Properties, to assist him in establishing a one-hour restricted parking zone in front of 200 East College Avenue. Uh, Mr. Hinkins provided the following explanation for his request. Uh, vehicles belonging to residents of adjacent properties frequently park long-term in front of his business. This property management business needs uh, several parking spaces available for customers to be able to visit the office during business hours. He estimates three time restricted parking spaces will be sufficient. According to the California Vehicle Code, local authorities may, by resolution, restrict the parking of vehicles on certain streets or portions thereof during certain hours of the day. Parking restrictions are already in place on a number of other streets and individual locations within the city. 
I met with the, with the business owner on location and he provided photographic evidence of parked vehicles at the location at several times. Engineering staff assessed the situation and recommends the establishment of a time-restricted parking zone. If approved by the council, then the location will be signed and marked in conformance with city code section 10, 12, 100, and such restriction shall apply between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. on any day except Sundays and holidays. The field work necessary to implement the restricted parking zone will include installing two new street signs and posts and painting 72 feet of green curb paint marking. The work is to be performed by the city's street maintenance division and funded from city street maintenance funds. The initial installation is estimated to cost $930 and annual maintenance is estimated to cost $200. Engineering staff recommends to the city council to adopt the resolution establishing a one-hour restricted parking zone in front of 200 East College Avenue. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Meyer? Councilmember Cordova. I just had two questions. Um, the first one, do we know the hours of operation of that business? Yeah, it's from nine to five. It is, it, it is the exact nine to five? Okay, because yeah. I was gonna suggest, um, you know, maybe expanding it a little bit from like eight to six just to allow enough time for the business to actually have, you know, but um, those were my two questions, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. We will now open for public comment. The number to call is 805-875-8201. Mute your TV, radio, or PC when your call is put through. This is for item three, adoption of resolution number 6320-6360, parentheses 20, to establish a one-hour restricted parking zone at 200 East College Avenue, 805-875-8201. Madam Clerk, did we have any written communications? No, ma'am. Thank you. Eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one. And remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC when your call is put through. Hearing no calls, we will close public comment and bring it back to council. Councilmember Vega. Um, I'll move forward uh, with us accepting. I'd like to recommend that we accept the resolution number 6360. Thank you. I'll second. Councilmember Starbuck has seconded. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. The last item on tonight's agenda is item number four, purchase of a 2021 Pierce Type 1 fire engine in the amount of $690,801.93. And we have Battalion Chief Mr. Brian Fetterman to present. <laughs> It's always hard to see the face behind the mask. Uh, Mayor and Council, thank you for letting me come before you tonight with Council's recommendation, or excuse me, staff's request for Council's to approve the contract to award purchase of a Pierce uh, fire engine. Um, I'd like to just give a little bit of an overview of our current fleet makeup, uh, just so you can understand how we got to this uh, request. The eight frontline apparatus, our fire suppression vehicles are listed here um, in descending order, um, made up of our frontline or first response units, as well as our backup command vehicles or, or uh, reserve apparatus. A couple key things that I would point out in these is that uh, this 1991 International Type 3, this is our first brush truck that we purchased from the county as a surplus vehicle in 2006. Uh, when they deemed it no longer useful for them 
And this was a great enhancement actually to our department because it was the first type three we actually got. And so we were able to provide a greater service to not just the surrounding area from the urban interface, but uh, be a, a larger asset to the state of California. The ladder truck, uh, as we see, is a, is a backup apparatus um, at 27 years old. Uh, this piece of equipment is actually running first out of the city for the past few days uh, due to other mechanical issues with our fleet. One of the biggest challenges with this piece of equipment, especially at 27 years old, is the company is no longer in existence. And so every time something breaks, we have to have a custom made part to fit that truck. Uh, and as you know, it is a big, very large piece of equipment. And so it, it uh, moves around and, and beats up the rig pretty hard. Um, the other 1998 KME, the Type 1, uh, that is also our backup apparatus and it is also running first out in the city. Uh, and you can see with 110,000 miles on it, the asterisk under the hours is because there was significant vehicle motor maintenance done to it and the hour gauge had to be replaced. Uh, so I don't have the current uh, hours on it, but we can uh, kind of get a better idea of where they might be. The 2002 is typically the front rig that's running out of Station 1 on South G Street. Uh, this, for the last 18 months, has been probably the biggest thorn in our side. Uh, we it was out of service for almost an entire year, uh, from midpoint of 18 into 2019, due to several mechanical issues. Uh, and just last weekend, at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, the transmission split in half on a call. Uh, rendering the vehicle completely unuseful. Um, the scary part about that uh, is that four days before the crew was interior on a structure fire uh, with a line and had an exposure line protecting an adjacent house on that same rig. So thank God it didn't break that night because we would have had some serious problems on our hand. Um, the 2008 Ford F-450 is the rescue vehicle, the crew cab uh, utility truck. We did actually just get, uh, and was in the previous budget, was a replacement vehicle for that. We have taken delivery of the 2019 Ram. Uh, it does not have a pump added into the back. We're waiting for that. Uh, and like anything with uh, COVID challenges, shipping is a problem. So we're still waiting for that, but that's gonna be a huge improvement. The 08 KME is, is uh, our newest type one, running out of station two on D Street. And you'll notice the 90,000 miles on that rig, it is quickly catching the 98. Um, and so it kind of highlights a little bit of the service demands of our community and increased load on these apparatus. And then our 2014 KME is the other, uh, the Type 3 is our front, front line brush truck that through uh, fees generated from uh, out of county fires, we were able to purchase that and put that as the front line. Uh, so right now that is up north and has been gone for about 21 days helping in California with the wildfires. So currently the city is running fire department on the 91 brush truck, the 93 ladder truck, and the 98 KME. Uh, so I say that and when we come before you to present how we look at needing new fire trucks, a lot of things that we reflect on in the fire service is definitely NFPA, which I know you've heard several times. Uh, the National Fire Protection Agency and in 1911. It's the standard for inspections and maintenance and testing and replacement of fleet. The extreme side of what they recommend is a 25 year total service life. Uh, and in the city, we've typically done 15 years frontline and 10 in reserve. Um, again, the 25 years is at the extreme, but you have to take in the additional factors of what is the wear and tear, what is the size of the district we serve, the age of the vehicle, the mileage and service hours, which I indicated before, um, other safety considerations, uh, be it that the mechanicals are breaking or other safety improvements. Um, original design, obviously, like your own vehicles, a lot of things change and the purpose of what we needed them for when we first bought them may evolve with our needs. And then the call volume, uh, we're definitely a busy department and I know you all know that. Uh, and then the maintenance and costs. So when we look at our fleet um, with uh, the, the corporate yard, we figure out, okay, well, how do we, what has challenged us from maybe our, why our fleet has gotten so old and why we're having some service problems? And naturally, if some revenues make it a challenge, these are big purchases and it's definitely not lost on us the cost of this apparatus um, and budget cuts that challenge the fleet division to uh, maintain all of city's fleet. Um, increased service demands to our community. Um, we've, we've talked about that often. You all are very well of, of those demands to meet the mission and, and serve this community. And then the increased cost of apparatus. Uh, 
like anything, they're not getting any cheaper um, and, and also not getting any cheaper to maintain. Um, what's significant in the, the barriers is uh, the fleet department actually installed a new software uh, late 17 and was able to start tracking what the increase were to each piece of equipment. And in talking with the fleet supervisor, uh, they noticed in 2018 an 11% increase in maintenance cost, but then in 2019, a 19% increase just to the fire department's fleet. So our return on our investment is, is definitely not there. Uh, and what we're seeing is an increase uh, in downtime of apparatus, and now we're also seeing that increase in vehicles not being able to respond, period. And so that jeopardizes our mission and obviously uh, really jeopardizes the safety of our personnel. So I say all that with the recommendations for you tonight, and, and while those are challenges, I think this is a great opportunity. Um, we're looking into a new Pierce pumper. Uh, that is a picture of San Luis's rig. This is one of the specs that we went off of. Uh, this is the newest delivery within the county. Uh, several departments are going with this new design. Um, ours is pretty close to this, the renderings that we have, it would not have a white top, but other than that, it would look very similar to that apparatus. And while I am not a financial expert like Mr. Albro, um, the $690,000 would be something that typically we look at in our fleet replacement with a lease purchase. Um, so we would not be, this would be something that as we look to pay off two of our other pieces of equipment with into the next budget cycle, we could roll over into the same um, lease payment model, and I know he can answer more of that. The build time, um, while we have these challenges in understanding our current fleet, the build time is still a year to a little over a year out, and every day that um, the salesmen are checking in, um, more contracts are coming in. So um, I, I'm excited to bring this tonight. Hopefully we can get in the door and, and beat some others to get into the build line. Um, but again, we won't see this for a year to a year and a half in our community, so we still got to make it through with the current fleet we have, as well as looking into the future of what other needs we're going to have, which are definitely there for us. Um, so that's my short presentation. I really thank you for your time and your consideration, and I'm available for any questions you may have. Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, Brian, um, I have two questions. The first one, under the fiscal impacts, and this is going to be an odd question, it says, <laughs> to meet the city's unique specifications. What is a unique specification with Lompoc? What makes us different? I, the report says we were aligning with San Luis, uh, us, and Santa Barbara City to get a station, or a station, a, 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 a truck, but we're unique. Yeah, so I'll do my best to answer that. Part of it has to do with the way our um, purchase agreements exist and how we do our bidding process for any large piece of equipment over a certain dollar value. And so when you look at how do we have the ability to do a sole sourcing type purchase, this type of apparatus and what we're looking into with specifics to what it does, um, the innovation that has come with Pierce, there's some configurations with the pump, how it's been moved and there's more storage capacities and all of that. That's one of the only ones out there of all the manufacturers of fire apparatus that's doing it. So um, wh when I say unique, it's, it's a unique design because it's actually differing from what our current fleet is. Uh, we have what right now uh, KME, which is Kovach Fire Equipment, which was bought out by another party and that actually owns six different manufacturers. And so we've had some challenges uh, um, with KME, and so that's what's pushed us towards looking at this particular manufacturer. I like that kind of unique. I was thinking of something really weird, so I'll good. Let you, I'll let you go with that. <laughs> I just did. Um, the other thing I was kind of curious about, what are we going to do with all this old equipment? You know, we're, you said right now we're using the old brush truck mm -hmm. as a frontline truck. We have another truck that we can't support, which is a ladder truck, so we can't take it out of service. We've got several other type one trucks. Do we need all of this gear? Well, I would say it's a good thing we actually have it because once we sent a crew up north and the other two broke, we wouldn't have anything else. So having the backup is, is important. Um, the challenge, just in, to the brush truck comment, um, right now, with the wild and urban interface, some of the challenges we've had with the riverbed, we, we're still providing that service to this area, but to the county as a whole, when a brush fire comes out. So that's the rig that the crews are taking. What's tough with that one is we have to actually store it with a dry tank because the, drink tank, the tank is so cracked that it will leak out on the apparatus floor. So before we leave for a fire, the crew has to hook to a hydrant, fill it, 
and then run to the fire um, while it's leaking out on the floor. Um, so ideally, is it the best rig for us to have? Absolutely not. And we've looked at other, um, I've reached out to some of the oper operational area partners to see if they have other surplus rigs that can maybe buy us some time in the backup role, not the primary role, but just till we can get into a better replacement. Um, but it's a challenge. We're going to have to have some tough conversations. Um, this rig starts to get us in line with having a more uh, comprehensive replacement, but we still have several others that we need to start addressing. So as we forecast. You know, I guess where I'm going to kind of lead off with this is the fact that this will be the second fire truck that I've purchased being on council. The first one was our brush truck. Mm -hmm. What a rig. But I'm starting to wonder, it's not like we needed that. We really, it appears, needed a ladder truck or more type one engines. It seems as though the brush truck is something good to have so we can go off to fires and make a little extra money for the department. But did we make a mistake with that brush truck? No, I, I think we actually um, benefited ourselves as a community first and foremost. We actually have a bigger wildland threat than most people realize. I mean, when you look at the areas incorporated all the way from the prison to Hancock to Highway 1, that's all our dirt that we're responsible for. These type ones cannot go off road. Um, secondary to that, when you look at the cost reimbursement, and I know we've talked about it before from these, these fires, um, we're averaging anywhere between fifty to eighty thousand dollars a year just in fleet reimbursement from these fires. So um, we get kind of the added benefit of when they're not out, they're definitely here to serve the community. Um, but when they do go out, we're able to see a cost recovery that we can hopefully put away towards the replacement of it. Um, I understand the question, though. It, it, how, when we added that, then what did we give up in, in the other side? But as we look at what is our mission and what do we want to do, um, we have to ask those questions, too, of then how do we do that? And that's definitely one of them. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to draw the line at a Bore 8 bomber, no plane. I have no desire for aircraft. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions for Battalion Chief Fetterman? Thank you, appreciate it. We'll now open the floor to public comment. The number to call is 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. Please remember to mute your TV, radio, or PC, 805-875-8201. The item to comment on is the purchase of a 2021 Pierce Type 1 fire engine for our fire department. City Clerk, did we have any written communications? Yes, ma'am, uh, from Mr. Ron Fink. There was uh, well, public information or public comment, sorry. <laughs> uh, it was given to council, to staff, and it was provided on the city's website. Thank you. The number to call is 805-875-8201. 805-875-8201. Please mute your TV, radio, PC when your call is put through. Seeing no one call in, we will close oral communications and bring it back to council. Councilmember Cordova. Um, so just a quick question. Um, this truck, would this have come up as a purchase right now had, had the other truck not broken down? Uh, it was still in plans, still to, in plans. To, to be it. And when you, again, when you look back at the replacement cycle and needs, this was a conversation definitely that we've been having. Um, it just... The, the urgency of which it's being brought forward is definitely there because of what we're seeing as a repeat problem. Um, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And Dean, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, on the fiscal impact, it talks about um, bringing, soliciting the financing during the fiscal year 2021-2023 budget. So can you just clarify for me, we would be purchasing this right now, but then we would be working to I guess, finance this and get it. Explain to me how we would be purchasing this right now. Right now, we're asking for authority for the city manager to sign the contract to start building it. Um, in the next budget cycle, we have uh, two engines that aren't paid off yet. 
uh, the, the one with the shortest payment schedule, which will fall into the next budget cycle is two and a half years. So we would carry two, two payments for a while so we can try and get ahead of that and we'll have that one paid off in the same budget cycle. So that's what we're hoping to do. Okay, and then one more question. Um, the staff report mentioned, you know, that a, a systematic replacement plan is beneficial for the safety of the personnel and the public. Obviously, um, additionally, a sound financial plan allows stakeholders, both internal and external, for better, uh, to better predict the needs of the department. Um, does our current budget model, does, does it have replacement for vehicles and, and this type of equipment for the fire department in this case? If you're asking me, um, I'm not, I don't usually decide who, which vehicles, but what we do is a, a gather a group, if you will. Um, usually it's, it's, the, it's based on how long they last. They set the financing, and that's why we have two of them, and usually they would be replaced. I dirt put his, hit it on the head. He goes, we've got the brush truck in there to kind of set, up off, set us off schedule. We really should probably have three in the replacement if we're going to do three lines. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but um, usually... Well, my main question is just, I understand the importance of, of purchasing this, and I'm all for it. Um, I just wanted to know um, if our budget, if our actual budget provides a plan, a systematic plan, as calls out in the actual um, staff report for the benefit and the safety of the personnel and the public to to predict the, the replacement of these types of items within our budget. As part of the budget cycle, we do assess all vehicles and come up with a replacement each budget cycle, what we think is costing us too much, um, like this one is costing us too much, and what needs to be replaced. So it is part of our budget cycle where we evaluate our fleet operation. So you're, I, I think if I may, council member, is if there's what's not, it's commonly called to just a replacement fund, so every year, if you're buying a $10,000 car, it's worth 10 years. Every year, we're going to put $1,000 into the bank. So at the end of 10 years, assuming it's needing to replace, we have the $10,000 left with some inflationary factors. And that's the one. We, we do have something similar to that. We're going to be working towards that on the new budget cycle. I'm going to be asking Fleet to definitely be involved as to breaking it out. Um, I know there are some issues in years past so we're going to be one of those things is working on that one it is tough in our position um, to successfully budget for that because usually in our position we'll have especially when we go through all of the different rolling stock that we have you'll see the the need is this much but we can maybe only do half of that so i know in other cities i've been we weren't able to put any money into it in other cities, we were able to actually have more than we needed where we stopped collecting for a number of years because we had collected enough and fleet was able to maintain the cars and trucks long enough so we got more years out of them. But that is something that I'd want to focus on on this next budget cycle. Thank you for answering the question. Councilmember Mosby. So if you look at Santa Maria's budget book, I think they have their fleet, I've sh shared with the uh, Mr. Albro, um, they have a very proactive uh, fleet replacement in there, so it's diagrammed out, you know, years in the future, so people can see some of this planning and anticipate. Uh, in, in the past, um, counts would just prove a fleet acquisition number. Uh, I think I was one of the first guys a couple of years ago to ask for the list. Um, so it's been kind of, you know, a little bit blinded, and then you get distracted. You end up spending the money somewhere else where you should stay in tune so you know please uh, uh, make sure that we're taking care of business I know that the police chief has been having difficulty but fortunately he's doing great now he's got vehicles that can get from A to B and back to A again um, but you're, you're good with what this vehicle is going with oh yes no I actually when we first were looking and discussing because uh, we've been talking about this the, the fire and I um, was KME and I just went oh that's not my first choice you know I was not happy with the KME and then when Pierce did come back and said we can essentially match what KME said I went wow this is you're getting the best truck that's out there on the market so yeah. I was very shocked that they would do that but um, I'm not going to turn it turn it down so yes I I completely agree with this okay you're good too 
I, can, I can't see you smiling though. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I, we've actually wanted to get Pierce apparatus in our city just because of their reputation and their, their um, longstanding quality of their build. So when they came in, um, it, it was a, a huge improvement. Plus they've put together a maintenance yard uh, in Paso Robles now. Uh, to help service the West Coast. So just the downtime and turnaround time from us if we have maintenance needs should be improved from that aspect also. See his light's still on, but I'll wait to make a motion to approve, but uh, if you got a question, or do you want to just second my motion? Oh, I did Council. have a question, and I can... Council uh, Member Vega? Yes, ma'am. You now have the floor. Is, can I speak now? Thank you, sorry. Um, I, Dean, if I could, could you step me through the process if once we approve this, what the expenditure is, uh, once the contract's signed, uh, is there a deposit and where is that coming from before we get to that point? Um, how much do you have to spend to sign a contract right now so that the bill goes out? Because we talked about the other uh, payment schedules. Um, where we're not quite paid off yet, but we're almost there. So is there money that has to be moved around to get to this point when we order this? Uh, I'm not aware of any down payment or anything. There's no deposit, or, or, there's no yeah. down payment. It's just they start building it and you pay for it because we're the city of Lompoc. Is that how that works? Well, well that's what we're asking for tonight for the authority for the, the city manager to sign the contract to mm -hmm. move forward with it. I'm gonna and, look at Brian real quick, but I actually believe we don't actually start paying on it until we actually receive the vehicle. Isn't that correct? That's later in the year, we'll is. go out for uh, financing bids. And then once we get the financing bids, and hopefully they'll be getting close to having it built and then we can start paying on it and playing on it. Hey, thank you. And I'll give uh, Mr. Mosby a second. Do you wanna actually make a formal motion? <laughs> make Council a formal motion to approve. Thank you. Purchasing. And now you truck. make your formal second. All right. The so contract. It's been moved and, Sorry. and seconded. Sorry, I misunderstood. That's okay. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any other questions? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Any additional written comments, Madam Clerk? No, ma'am. Thank you. Our final oral communication of the evening is open. You will have two minutes to speak on city matters. The uh, number to call is 805-875-8201. Please remember to mute your TV, radio, PC when your call is put through. Again, the number is 805-875-8201. Final oral communication for the evening, two minute maximum. We'll close oral communication and bring it back to council for comments, meeting reports. Council Member Vega. I heard myself, but shoot. I'm gonna have a council request that uh, uh, something's come up on the sign ordinance uh, around town with political signs, and I think it's something that we need to reference. After having conversations with our planning manager, it looks like there could be some changes done as far as any restrictions for signs regarding political signs here. We, uh, we need to have a uh, planning manager come back and see if we can uh, amend that ordinance so that we're not out of compliance as far as for sign sizes and locations. Uh, we've never had this come up before, but obviously there was something that was missed. Um, so I'd like uh, to have a council request to see if we can get the planning manager to bring back the sign ordinance for the changes for the political signs during this 90 day period from which people actually file to run for office. I'll give you a second. Give you a third.
For clarification for the public, would our city attorney please explain that political signs are not mentioned in our sign ordinance. It's actually the category is temporary signs and that political signs are considered temporary signs? That's right. Political signs are not mentioned in the sign ordinance, but the signs are regulated by the type of sign that they are. So political signs are usually certain types of signs. Um, yard signs or banner signs, those are usually the kinds that are political signs. And what I understand Councilmember Vega's request is to bring back the sign ordinance so the council can discuss what changes they might want to make to the regulations on the types of signs that are usually used as political signs. Thank you. Councilmember Starbuck? Yeah, just a quick question. You know, the reason I was second this and go with it is uh, Caltrans, you sign a form, state you will remove your temporary sign at you know so many days after election etc um, I'm guessing that something in our ordinance is not aligned in the temporary signs separating the political signs like Caltrans does then Caltrans does regulate political signs as political signs the you know the constitutionality of which is not our decision to make but um, but their rules apply only in our public rights of way on the city, on the um, state highways in town. Well, and that permission also does have parameters. It does speak as to what can and can't be and how close it can or cannot be to the right of way and how um, many feet. And so there are additional rules as part of that permission that you submit that you're going to follow those rules when you submit that sign. So um, that, per that permit request. So again, it's not a blanket Yes, you get to do whatever you want. There are rules associated with their placement as well, and I believe the county has them also for anywhere in the county area. I think it's unfortunate that we, uh, four of us up here are running and have decided to bring something back that's affecting us when we ask the entire public to follow these rules. So I, I don't think it's ethical. It may be legal, but I really don't think it's ethical for us to be having this discussion right now. Councilmember Cordova. On uh, February 18th, I have a council, well, I guess council request on a council request. Um, on February 18th, we discussed the riverbed cleanup. We discussed some um, ideas. There was ideas brought forth by uh, Mayor Osborne as well as by Council Member Mosby as to how we could continue to um, mitigate the issues at the riverbed as well as there was a staff presentation on the cleanup. Um, if we went back into the riverbed, um, as you know, um, it is supposed to be coming back. It is on the proposed future agenda, but there is no date for that. And I really would like to put a date on it. On that meeting, I went back and looked at the footage. I specifically uh, requested that this did not go further out than six or eight months because of the amount of investment that the city um, had made in the original cleanup of this riverbed. There are a lot of components to this that um, affect our, our quality of life, our citizens, our business community, and I think that it needs to be brought back. Understanding, and I know that with the whole COVID, that derailed a lot of our, um, a lot of our issues um, and made other things priorities, but I wanted to see about when we could actually put a date on this and bring this back as it is listed as unfinished business. Um, let me get with like the different staff members that are going to be dealing with this one and see if we can get it. I'm going to guess the earliest would be the, like the second meeting in October, but I'd have to find out what other things they're working on. But that'll be my goal at the moment is the second meeting in October. Okay. Councilmember Starbuck. No reports. Thank you. Councilmember Mosby. I represent the city of Lompoc at the San Barbara County Association of Governments meetings, the Air Pollution Control District meeting, the San Inez Groundwater Management Agency. Um, I'd also like to make sure there's clarification. I mean, we talked about the parks and rec staff, and there was a, conf a statement that made by public comment just to make sure that the dots are connected appropriately. It's... Um, I'm sure you've, you'll take care of that. Uh, the other thing was uh, reviewing back, a comment was made too, but reviewing back in the minutes, 
<clears throat> of the June 2nd, 3rd meeting. Uh, it talked about three of the votes, but it didn't talk about even referencing the other two votes. I, I assume, I, I know how I voted, but I think you know, there's probably some tidying up needs to be done with that on that on the minutes from the June 3rd meeting of how we got from June 2nd to June 3rd. I don't know if the city attorney had an opportunity to to look at that, but um, that was something I'd referenced before and we'd agreed to move forward with. The, you know, there's a statement made about grants and one of the reasons why I referenced grants, understanding what County Parks does with grants. As a County Park Commissioner, County Parks is 74 to 76% self-funded. Uh, it's, it's amazing to have a, a park group that's funded that way. Granted, they have Kachuma Lake and they also have uh, Halama to help offset their expense, but they have a $15 million budget that they're operating on. It's a significant budget. Uh, and they do a significant amount of their build out in, in, with grant monies, whether it's uh, items at Kachuma Lake, whether it's new bathrooms at Halama, but there's millions of dollars of grants available that are out there, and county parks would not be what they are without, without grants. And, and roughly 20 years ago, the police budget, and granted things changed through time, but the police budget was almost 20% funded by grants. Um, so there are opportunities out there that we must look for, and our community does qualify for a lot of grant funding. Uh, it's, it, it, there, there's a bunch that are gonna be coming up with the Prop 64 grants, in the next year or two, there's, there's significant amount, and the city of Lompoc will qualify for millions of dollars for public safety support, according to what Prop 64 says, and as the state gains more and more of their revenues. They're gonna have a lot of money in that kitty, and we need to make sure we're in line to get that revenue. Um, I would like to make a, a council request. There were statements that were made about the, um, well, we, some of them we know was Mylar balloons, but it's electrical conducting balloons. And there was a statement made that they are very, uh, uh, you know, it's what put out the, the power over on this side of town. Um, but I guess we have as many as two or three of these events in a week with these electrical conducting balloons that are doing this and causing havoc, uh, a much bigger item than, um, uh, you know, a lot of the, the issues we're having. They, not only there's power outages, but then you're having fire, fly, fires that come from these, um, these balloons. And it is a $1,000 fine for a misdemeanor for releasing one of these balloons at certain events um, because of the issue. I did witness myself seeing a balloon hit a power line. It took out that whole side of town and initiated a fire over on that side of the town. So they are, they are dangerous and hazardous. My council request is to come back with a discussion with possible action on doing something with these balloons. Uh, but definitely initiate the discussion to see, you know, electric department, fire department, they could come and chime in and tell us what's going on. I know it's a heck of an inconvenience it was for the people on the south side of town when their, their power outage was there with a, a balloon that was released in the morning, so. Um. I'll give you a second. I actually saw one of those recently myself. I'll give you a third. Thank you. Excuse me, Madam Mayor. Yes. Can I ask for clarification on the minutes? What exactly you were looking for, Council Member Mosby? A representation of what the vote was. It's on there. It says three, but it doesn't say what the other two did. Did even two others vote? It says a three two vote, but was there or three vote to suspend, right? But it, does it reference the other two votes? Well, I would say you want the other two votes to be named. I, I think it should be a reference, yes. That's not how we name anything on the votes, though. The Vandenberg Air Force Base notified us today that there will be a Minuteman test launch window early Wednesday morning, so in a few hours between 12.02 a.m. and 6.02 a.m. for those of you that um, might hear the rumble. I know it's on the north end of base, but just as a warning. Um, the Lompoc Valley Medical Center and Caring Together is having a virtual Alzheimer community forum on Tuesday, September 22nd 
from one to three. So those of you that would like to understand Alzheimer's dementia and memory loss, as well as how you might help family um, should register for that, you can call 800-272-3900 or visit HTTPS semicolon forward slash forward slash BIT dot LY forward slash 31 YN FPG to register. And you can also contact the hospital for more information on that. And last but not least, earlier in the evening, we had a call asking for additional clarification. Um, as of yesterday, Public Health issued an update to Appendix A. Under that, item 35 of Appendix A, B, it says youth sports and physical education will all, when all of the following are maintained. Outdoors, physical distancing of at least six feet between participants can be maintained and it is stable cohort such as a class that limits the risk of transmission in accordance with CDBH guidance for youth sports available at, and it links to an additional PDF. So uh, I might ask that staff make a posting and a clarity on our social media page um, to help with the uh, local organizations to better understand that. I'll make sure that this um, gets to you. I know you guys know where to find it, I'm sure that um, Ms. McGinty can find that HTBS file on COVID youth sports that is linked to it in that and can post that for any clarification. I attended TANK and uh, NCPA meetings. I represented the city at the Leadership Lompoc Valley Government Day webinar, and then I met with the uh, Reverend for Reverend Price for the First Methodist Church to discuss concerns about some of the homeless issues um, they're experiencing in the community. Um, I also met with uh, Ms. Wilson, the Chamber for the CEO, to review the USDA and Center for Community and Prosperity representation, um, the application that is being submitted, and assisted her with information she needs to complete that by today's deadline. I also want to welcome the new pastor, Cray, for True Vine Bible Fellowship. He invited me to come up and meet him and better understand our community as he... Um, joins us and uh, was very excited to invest in the youth in our community, so we look forward to his uh, new leadership. I also report, participated in the weekly Santa Barbara legislative calls and met with Steve Frank of Pell Blue Dot on some updates regarding um, how the funding's going, so he is still um, seeking funding, so anyone who has investors and is interested in that, please reach out to Pell Blue Dot. We will adjourn this meeting until the next regular meeting at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, September 15th, 2020.